Let's say that one more time. Say, I am thirsty. I am thirsty. Come on, everybody, feel it's real simple. I am wanting more and more of you. How many want more of God today? Come on, lift your hands and say it. I am thirsty. I am needy. I am thirsty. I am needy. I want more and more. I am wanting more and more of you. Come on, can we lift that up again one more time? Just one more time. Everybody, come on, say it like this. I am thirsty. I am thirsty. I am needy. I am wanting more and more of you. I am thirsty. Come on, let's fill this house. Let's say it. Fill this house. Fill this house with your glory, Lord. Fill this place with your presence. Fill this house with your presence. Fill this house with your presence. Oh, ancient of death. Come on, say it. Fill this house with your glory, Lord. thirsting after having a little more each and every day gets this, to know a little more about God every single day
Yes, yes, yes. Go ahead and take your seats for a moment. Just want to let that meditate, let that rest on somebody. I am thirsty. I am needy. I want more and more of you. That's a message all within itself. The scripture talks about we should thirst after righteousness. And if we're thirsting for righteousness, then we're going to find a righteous God. I stand before you this morning to deliver a word from, from the Lord today. I want to give our honor where honor is due to our bishop and our pastor for allowing this opportunity. I am no stranger to most of you. For those of you that may be watching by way of social media, I'm Minister Sharp. One of the ministers here at the Tabernacle, uh, I'm just here to give you what God gave me, and I'm going to get out of your way. Promise I won't hold you no longer than the Spirit requires. Media, if you're ready, I'm going to step aside for about two and a half minutes. There's something I need you to put your focus on on the screens. There's a picture in the museum in the Louvre. I don't know how many of you have been there. The picture is called Checkmate. The devil's sitting on this side. There's a chessboard, and there's a guy sitting on the other side. And the guy sitting on the other side has his hand on his head like this. And he's like in desperation. And as they were taking a tour through the Louvre, there had been a group of of, of, of athletes and particularly ch world champions that were being given a special tour. And in the tour was the world chess champion. And he comes walking by the picture and the guy's explaining to him, this is a picture of an artist rendering of somebody who lost the battle with the devil. And so the group moved on to the next picture to see something else. But the world chess champion, he stayed there and he just kept looking at the picture. And soon they noticed that he was not with the group. And so the tour guide came back and said, we've, we've, we've moved on, are you, are you coming? He said, well, I've been looking at this picture. And the guy said, yeah, he said, it's, it's called Checkmate. The devil's laughing, the man's lost. And he said, yeah, he said, I've been noticing that. He said, but while I've been standing here, I've kept looking at the picture. I'm, I've, I've got I got a problem and he said well what, what do you mean he said well you know I'm a I'm a world champion chess player and I spend my life playing chess and normal people don't always see what a world champion chess player sees he says but when y'all walked off I looked at the devil laughing and I looked at the man in desperation but he said, I noticed something on the chessboard. He said, either they're going to have to change the painting or they're going to have to change the name. And the guy said, well, why are they going to have to do that? He said, well, you know, I'm a world champion chess player. And he said, when I observed the board, I found out the king still has one more move. I come to tell somebody today, you believe you've been cornered. You believe everything is gone and nothing has got any hope, but the king still has one more move in the fullness of time. God sent his son. I dare you to declare it. The king has one more move. He has one more move over my finances. He has one more move over my marriage. He has one more move over my kids. It is not over. Matthew 28, verse 1 reads, 
In the end of the Sabbath, as it began to dawn toward the first day of the week, came Mary Magdalene and the other Mary to see the sepulchre. And behold, there was a great earthquake. For the angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat upon it. His countenance was like lightning and his raiment white as snow. And for fear of him, the keepers did shake and became as dead men. And the angel answered and said unto the women, Fear not ye, for I know that ye seek Jesus, which was crucified. He is not here, for he is risen, as he said, Come, see the place where the Lord lay. Gracious God, I thank you for this opportunity, Lord. I thank you now for this time of fellowship with you. Now, Father, I just ask that you would empty me of myself. Fill me with your word. Fill me with your spirit. Fill me with your love. Touch my tongue that it will speak only that of which you have ordained for me to speak. Touch the eyes, ears, heart, and mind of the hearer and the seer, Father, that this, that this word will take root and manifest in their lives as it has in mine. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Many of us in this, with this scripture, we think of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. We think of this scripture as a Easter sermon, and a resurrection message. While yes, it is about the resurrection of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, there are some things in here I need to point out about all of this to go to the backdrop of the video, the king still has one more move. From the beginning of the week, we've heard things in the news of, well, for the last several weeks, we'll say, there was murders in Buffalo, church shooting in California. There was a school shooting in Texas. There was... Uh, just last night in West Virginia, I read this morning that there was a, a shooting at a, a party, a graduation slash birthday party. There's death all around us. There's violence all around us. Yes, the war in Ukraine is still going on, and the president of Ukraine said this morning, or I read this morning, that, that he's expecting now a catastrophe to, great, to, to, to a great extent for not just Ukraine, but Russia as well. So when we see all the things that's going on around us, it draws me back to the cross. Because when I look at the scriptures that lead up to this scripture, there was death going on. There were wars going on. There was abuse going on. But yet and still, the king had another move. Right. Yeah. Even when the enemy thought he had you, the king had a way of escape. Right. Hence the term, the scapegoat. So when, 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 when I look at this, it just draws my attention. And it makes me wonder, what is the next move that God's about to make? Right. I, I'm not worried about the ones he's already done because they will stand for themselves. I'm more concerned with what God is doing right now and what he's going to do. I, I, I don't fully, and I won't try to even fool you with this, I don't fully understand the mind of God. What little understanding I have is just very min, min, minuscule. But I know enough to know that God is ever working in my life. I know enough to know that when my back is against the wall, as long as the wall is the solid rock on Christ I stand, I'm in good standings with my Lord. So now let's catch us up to this scripture. And to do so, I have to go back to Matthew 27. And I'll touch in, in, in Luke a little bit and maybe even touch in John to get the scriptures all together to get us to this point. So we can see all the different moves that the king made when they, the people thought they had him. Right. So you can't, you can't 
outthink the man that made the game. He already knows all the rules, all the twists, all the turns. He has already thought out the move that you're going to make three steps before you made it. And he has a counter move for anything you can do. Matthew 27, 27 through 31 coincides with Luke 23 and 34. Matthew 27 says, Then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the common hall and gathered unto him the whole band of soldiers. There's a war going on. And they stripped him and put on him a scarlet robe. Put your finger there for a second. Just for a footnote, the scarlet robe represents royalty and honor. They didn't realize that they were, they were beginning to put the king in his proper place. His proper place is on the throne. His proper place is to sit high and to look low. They didn't realize that they were helping him to establish the kingdom that was already his. They, they overlooked some things and, and they messed up some things along the way that only enacted the power of God that much more. All right, all right. 29 says, and then they had plaited a crown of thorns. They put it upon his head and a reed in his right hand and they bowed the knee before him and mocked him saying, Hail, King of the Jews. Put your finger there for a second. They're going to call him king of the Jews. They're going to put him in royal garments. Then they're going to crucify him. It wasn't their plan. That wasn't their plan. That was the plan of God. Because Jesus came to fulfill the prophecy. He had no other choice. It's either he's going to fulfill it or there will be no prophecy. But they didn't realize that their words have power. Understand this. If you don't get anything, your words have power. When you speak over your children, speak life over your children. When you speak over a situation, speak life into that situation. Not death because your words have power. They didn't realize that they were only enacting, they were only stirring up something that was going to come forth and manifest itself anyway. Your words have power. Verse 30 says, And they spit upon him and took the reed and smote him on the head, and after that they mocked him. They took the robe off of him and put his own raiment on him and led him away to crucify him. Luke 23 and 34 says, Then Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Let me, let me back that up. They plotted against the king. They abused the king. They mocked the king. They spat on the king. They beat the king. They stripped the king. But the king had a power move left. And the power move came in the form of love. The power move. Power move. See, see here, here's the thing. Pastor talked, preached and taught on the spirit of offense. It would have been easy to be offended after all of that happened to you. It would be easy to be offended when somebody spits on you, when somebody strips you of your clothes, when somebody mocks you. It would be easy to be offended. But Jesus, the king, had another move, and the move was to forgive them of their sins. For he says, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Right. It, it, yeah, 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 I know, I know what you're thinking. Well, that was Jesus. That was Jesus. But, but, but Jesus was walking in the flesh that day. Because in the scriptures, it says that he went to the hill to pray. And while he was praying, he says, Father, if it be thy will, let this cup pass. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, that was the flesh of the man talking, but the spirit of the man stood up and said, not my will, but thy will be done. Why? Because the king had another move. I don't know what's going on in your life, and I don't know who's got you held bound and down, but I want you to understand, cancer ain't the answer for my God. 
My God is bigger and greater. I don't know what your situation is. I don't know what your ailments are. But God says that's not the end. Because if he wanted to take you out, it's a thought. He doesn't even have to say it. It's a thought. He said, let there be. And there was. He didn't have to say trees, water, birds, animals. He said, let there be light, and light was. And darkness could not comprehend the light. He didn't have to tell darkness to go and hide. He just said, let there be. The king has another move. I want you to understand that it doesn't matter what your life looks like. If it's not the end of your life, there's still time. God's got a checkmate to your game. I promise you, you can't, the, the, the devil, the, the devil, he can't outwit God. He can't outsmart God. It's like your kids coming to you when, when you've, you've played a game with them for a while. and They think they got one up on you now. They're going to come running. I got you. I got you. Yeah, yeah. Okay, and they're going to make their move, and you've already thought three steps ahead of them. I know what he's getting ready to do. Been there, done that. I'm going to just go over here and wait for him to get here. That's how God treats the devil. Because the devil is not a match for God. He's a match for us. And if we walk in the will of God, he's not a match for us. The problem is we get out of the will. And we get in the way right. instead of letting God do what God's going to do. Your words have power. So when Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do, he opened up an avenue for forgiveness to come about. Now, it, it, they either have to accept it or not. But forgiveness was put out there for all to accept. But let's go on to Luke 23 and 37. See what happens in Luke. While we're getting, making our way to the resurrection, we must pay a visit to the crucifixion. Because first, to be resurrected, you have to first be crucified. To be resurrected, you have to first be dead. To be resurrected, you have to first be buried. Then comes the resurrection. I want you to understand that it's, it's, not, it's, 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 it's a process. And for you, it may be a little longer than it is for you. And it may take a little longer for you. Or it might not take that long for you, but there is a resurrection at the end of the process. Luke 23 says, And saying, If thou be the king of the Jews... Save thyself. Uh -huh. And a superscription also was written over him in letters of Greek and Latin and Hebrew. This is the king of the Jews. And one of the male factors which were hanged railed on him saying, If thou be Christ, save thyself and us. But the other answering rebuked him saying, Dost not thou fear God? seeing thou art in the same condemnation, and we indeed justly, for we, we receive the due reward of our deeds. But this man has done nothing amiss. And he said unto Jesus, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. And Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, Today shall thou be with me in paradise. Now, now here, here's what I want you to understand. There are two things going on right here. Two things I want to point out. You have one man on one side, one on the other side. Christ is in the middle. The two on the outside are receiving just due for their deeds. They're criminals. They're thieves. Okay? Jesus is getting the same uh, uh, punishment they're getting, but he's innocent of all charges. One man says, in the spirit of doubt, if you are, bring us down in yourself also. Here's what I want you to understand. You don't have to address everything your haters throw at you. You don't have to run down everything that somebody says about you. If they don't believe in you, understand God believes in you. And if God believes, that's all that matters. You keep going with what God has. Because when Jesus never responded, let me go back. God never responded to Jesus in the garden when Jesus said, if it be thy will, let this cup pass. 
Scripture does not say that God ever responded to that. Scripture does not record that Jesus ever responded to if you are, because there's some uncertainty there. You got to be sure about what you're sure about. You got to know what you know. You got to stand for what you know. You can't be standing on a possibility. You got to know what you know. And God says, I'm not caught up in your if. You got to know me for who I am. So the one man says, if you be. While the other man said, Lord, remember me. Number one, he addressed him for who he was. He addressed him properly. He called him Lord. And in that instant, everything he did before was wiped away. Everything. Because Jesus had already set forgiveness in motion in the previous scriptures. Forgiveness was already set in place. You just had to accept it. It's already there. Just accept forgiveness for what it is and move on. Don't live in the past. Forgiveness is already there. Just accept it and go on. It's been put in motion way before you ever got here. And that motion is still going on. And it's going to go until the end of time. So in case you miss it right now, when you get home, forgiveness is waiting for you at your door. Receive it as if you're receiving a gift from Amazon. Receive it with open arms. Run to the door. Grab up that box. Take it inside with all the joy and excitement. Take your knife, rip the top open, snatch it open, and stick your hands in it and pull it out and enjoy the gift of forgiveness as if it was something that you ordered from Amazon. Because you know and I know when you order something, you're waiting with an expectation of it to show up. And when you get the email that says it's on the way, you are getting a little more antsy. You start following Amazon around on your phone. They got 10 more stops today. Get to my house. My forgiveness is on the way. And then you get the email that says, your package has been delivered. But if you never open it, you won't receive the gift of forgiveness. Then all his hanging on the cross, all this bleeding would be in vain. The gift has been enacted and put in motion. And all you got to do is rip open the package and receive it. Proverbs 18. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. And they that love it shall eat the fruit thereof. Be careful what you say. It has a boomerang effect. The boomerang effect says, you throw it out there, it's going to come back to you. So if you don't want to see it again, don't put it in your mouth. If you don't want to see it again, don't throw it out there. If you don't want to see it again, you might want to tuck it away. You might want to burn it. But don't put it in the atmosphere because the winds of the atmosphere have some strange way about them. They'll take it out so far and then they'll hook it around and they'll bring it right back to you. And when it comes back, it's going to be bigger, stronger and more powerful than it was when you sent it out. That's for the good and the bad. So if you want if you want prosperity, you better send prosperity out. If you want righteousness, send righteousness out. If you want holiness, send holiness out. Why? Because the king has another move for you. I don't care where you are. I don't care what it looks like. It doesn't matter to God. There's a move waiting. There's a move. Now, Jesus, being the king, is not done yet. He's still on the cross. He's still got to take care of some business while he's there. 
John 19 tells us, 19 and 26, when Jesus therefore saw his mother and the disciples standing by, whom he loved, he said unto his mother, Woman, behold thy son. Then saith he to the disciple, Behold thy mother. Read it close. And from that hour, that disciple took her into his own home. Why is that important? Well, if she doesn't have a male factor in her life, and this day and time, everything that she has can and most likely will be taken away from her. She is not considered as a first class, probably not even a second class citizen. She's got her back against the wall and she's going to have to fight for everything that she has. But even in his darkest hour, the king had a move for his mother that was going to change her life. Even in your darkest days, there's still a move in your life the king is ready to make. If you're not laying in a casket with a cold body, the king is still working in your life. If you got air and breath in your body, the king still has a move for you. And even in your death, the king has a move still waiting for you. But before he left the scene, in the flesh, in the natural, yes, he felt the pain of the, of the nails. Yes, he felt the pain from the piercing. Yes, he felt the pain of, of blood leaving his body. Yes, he felt it all. And they will even tell you that there were legions of angels he could have called down. I tend to believe that not one angel would have left his post because God had not ordained for them angels to leave their post to go see about him. If God wanted to change it, he would have said it when he was in the garden and he asked, if it be thy will. But since God didn't answer, it wasn't God's will. It was going to happen. And it only came to happen because Jesus had to fulfill prophecy. And, 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 and it, it just in case, just, just in case, I'm going to come back and pick up in Matthew and 27 in a minute, but just in case, the book of Isaiah 53 lets us understand some things. It says, verse 1, Who has believed our report, and to whom this is the arm of the Lord revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant, and as a root out of a dry ground, he has no form nor comeliness. And when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised and we esteemed him not. Does that sound like your life? Because it surely reminds me of some days in my life. But they ain't talking about me. They're talking about Jesus right here. This is the prophecy that he had to fulfill. Now, I'm going to drop down a little bit to verse 7. It's No, no, no. Verse 6. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed. He was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He didn't say a mumbling word. He was brought as a lamb to the slaughter and as a sheep before her shears is dumb. He was, he, so he opened not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment. And who shall declare his generation? For he was cut off out of the land of the living. For the transgression of my people was he stricken. And he made his grave with the wicked. One on the left and one was on his right. And with the rich in his death, the man whose tomb that he, uh, Joseph's tomb that he was borrowing, because he had done no violence, neither was he deceit, any deceit in his mouth. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He has put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed. He shall prolong his days and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Jesus only came to fulfill prophecy. If it had not been spoken in Old Testament, there was no reason for it to happen in New. His life was all about fulfilling prophecy, and he would tell you that. 
Even when he was talking to his disciples, he said, I, go to, I have to go away. I'm, I'm letting you know right now that I'm going to be leaving you soon. And they didn't want to believe it. Matthew 27, starting at verse 50. When he had, Jesus, when he had cried again with a loud voice, yielded up the ghost. And behold, the veil of the temple was rent in twain from the top to the bottom. The earth did quake and the rocks rent. And the graves were open and many bodies of the saints which slept arose and came out of their graves after his resurrection and went into the holy city and appeared unto many. Now when the centurion and they that were with him watching Jesus saw the earthquake and those things that were done, they feared greatly saying, truly, this was the son of man. Well, well, <clears throat> I want to, I want to, put just a little emphasis on the earthquake. Okay, just a little emphasis. And I don't know who this is for. But God has, sometimes has to shake us. That's what an earthquake is. It's a shaking of the earth. God sometimes has to shake us to get our attention. Shake us, as Deacon Digg says, to awaken us. Shake us to get us where he wants us. But it's not for us. It's for everybody else to see. Because what happened after the, the earthquake, it says first Jesus gave up the ghost. He died. First, we got to learn to die to ourselves. We got to give up this fleshly ghost. We cannot go through life living in the flesh because it will lead and guide us in the wrong direction every time. Every time it's going to lead us and guide us wrong. Now, there were a number of things that happened. The veil in the temple was rent, torn, okay, from top to bottom, and then the earth did quake. The reason for the earthquake was to put God's stamp on his own son. I want you to know exactly who you're dealing with. I want you to know exactly what's going on here. I don't want there to be any if, ands, and buts about it. God is going to do, God has put a stamp on you, 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 and all of you. Everyone that, has, has, that, that is saved by the blood of God, by the blood of the Lamb, has a stamp on them. You've been sealed with the signet, and the devil's job is to break that seal. In order for God, in order for the devil to break the seal, you have to give up your stamp. Jesus was not willing to give up his seal, his stamp. So when he gave up the ghost, they didn't take his life. He gave it. When he gave it up, the earthquake happened to let you know, how I view it, to let you know, this ain't over. I want you to go on. And I, you, they, they recognize who Jesus was. Now they have to deal with what they've done to the one that they doubted, the one that they didn't believe in. But notice in the first scripture I read, my main scripture, there was an earthquake as the stone was rolled away. The first earthquake signified death. The second earthquake signified life. Because when they got to the tomb, there was not a dead body there. So, so, so in between your earthquakes, I want you to understand there are going to be some dark days in your life. God's going to send an earthquake on this side that says you have to die to something right now. But then he's going to take you down into your death, your, your, your burial clothes. And he's going to wrap you because you're dead. He's going to place you on that, that, that concrete, that stone block. He's going to put you a little pillow there. But while you're there, I want you to understand that God is still working. It looks dark. It is dark. There's no light in this tomb. They put a stone in front of it so light can't get in. There's no way for you can't see anything. You're dead. But God is yet working. And as long as God is working, as long as God is working, you're going to be okay. And, and from last time I checked, God's been working from day one to the, to the end of time. God's going to still be working. So I'm going to always be okay as long as I got my hand in God's hand. But what happened then was that when they took him down from the cross and put him in the tomb, 
that, that was borrowed because he knew in three days he was getting up. Why do I need to pay for this thing? I'm just going to borrow one. All right. It's not going to do me. It's not going to benefit me any, anything. But, but they took him down. They put him in the cross, uh, in the tomb, and now he's there. And seemingly nothing is going on. Seemingly they've won. The people have gotten it all wrong. They think they, uh, they've done this thing. They've accomplished. they won. If this was a basketball game, then it would be down to the last seconds. You're down by four points. They got the ball, and it's 10 seconds to go. Chances of you coming back from that loss, from that, is slim to none. Ah, but they don't know who the king is. And the king still had another move. And the king dropped a three on them. Because it says in three days, the king dropped a three on them, stole the inbound pass, and laid it up to win the game. Checkmate game over. But what's the story of your life? Somebody right now is in a dark place. You think God forgot about you. No, God put you there. He knows exactly where you are. He didn't forget about you. He put you there to preserve you. He put you there to keep you. Because when he brings you out, the people that thought they put you there are going to come back to see about you. They're going to hold a conversation with you and not even going to recognize you for who you are. Until you call them by their name and let them know that it's me. The people that tried to destroy you, the people that stepped on you, the people that left you for dead, the people that walked out on you, you're going to see them again. And when they see you, they're not going to recognize you because now you have been, you have transformed from flesh to spirit. And, and yeah, you can walk around in this body and still walk in a spiritual nature. I want you to understand that they're not going to recognize you as, as Michael Butts the next time they see you. They're going to see something different. They're not even going to know who you are. But they're going to have a conversation with you about you, not knowing they're talking to you. And when you pull your trump card, when you say checkmate, when you, I, I, don't, know, I don't know the whole game of chess. I, I, I don't know how it goes, but I know two things about chess. The queen's a bad girl. And the king is the one she's protecting. And as long as the queen is there to protect the king, the king ain't got nothing to worry about. So, so, so I'm sorry. I'm sorry if this message ain't for you. But I got a queen over here. And my queen is always on her post. And my queen will not let everything get to me. If you don't have you a queen, you might want to go and get you one. Women, if you are women, you better get you a king because your king is there to protect you and provide for you. But yet my queen keeps things from getting to me. I don't know everything to go on even in my own house. Why? Because my queen doesn't tell me everything that's going on in my house because I don't have to address every situation. She has the power, the authority, and the anointing to deal with whatever comes her way. But if by chance my queen decides to drop it in my lap, it is my responsibility and my duty to take care of the situation as godly as I can. Not working in self, but working in the spirit of God. For when God calls my name, I'm going to rise up because my king has another move. Life ain't over. I don't care if it looks dirty, if it smells bad, if it sounds bad. There is another day coming. Pick yourself up. Dust yourself off. Get ready for the game. I don't care if you're the bench warmer at the end of the bench. You're going to get some playing time in this game. You just got to be ready. Tom Brady was the third string quarterback. Seventh round draft pick. Heralded as the greatest quarterback to ever play the game. Don't tell me God forgot about you. Just wait on him. The vision is yet for an appointed time. 
It will speak. And when it does, it's going to speak real loud. And the world ain't going to be ready for it. So what you messed up? I did too. So what you got some things wrong? I did too. So what you lied? I did too. I don't care what your situation is. I probably did half of them. But in the earlier scriptures, forgiveness was set in motion. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was one of the ones that mocked him. I was one of the ones that spat on him. I was one of the ones that, that, that abused him until I came to know him. Forgiveness was set in motion. The king put forgiveness in motion before we even thought we were going to, before we knew what forgiveness was. Forgiveness was in motion before we were thought of by our parents. Forgiveness. And that train keeps on running. In fact, it don't, it, it, it's, it's like it, it's moving, but it ain't going nowhere, if that makes sense. Because it's everywhere you go. At any point in time in your life, you can accept forgiveness and be redeemed back to the Father. At any point in time in your life, you can, you can, you can receive, ex, open that gift up that's been sitting on your table and, and, and somebody put a note on it, hold till Christmas. Yeah, I know, I know. Yeah, yeah, I got one of those one time. And I, I tell you what, it was the hardest thing to do to wait till Christmas to open this package that came to my house in the mail. And I got to say, I'm going to wait till Christmas. But you got to wait sometimes on the Lord. Yeah. Be of good courage. Right. Wait, I say, on the Lord. Yeah. Weeping may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning. The king's got a lot of moves left on the table. Not just one move. He's got a lot of moves left. And if he made the one Trump move that he could easily make, he ends the game altogether. But because he doesn't want to end the game, he wants us to have some, 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 some fun in this, I guess. He, he's going to say, okay, here we go. I'm just going to move over here. I'm going to have another move. Go for it. Go for it. What's your best move? Show me what you got. No, you don't want to do that. You, you, ever, you ever been playing against somebody that tries to talk you out of your game? I grew up, I grew up playing basketball in the backyard with my dad and my brothers, my neighbors. And, and, and they would try to talk you out of your game. Nah, you don't want to do that. You know I'm, I'm going to block that shot. Go for it. Go for it. I got you. I got you. And you know what? In the beginning, it would get me. They would take me out of my game. And then my daddy would just play your game, David. Just play your game. I love you, daddy, if you're listening. <laughs> but I'm, I'm, I'm being picked on by the bigger guys, and then I got my daddy yelling at me. My game is shot. I'm thinking about going in the house and having to hear this whole story all over again because he's going to coach me when we get in the house later on. And I got the guys over here that's going to, I just feel like they're going to jump on me if I do beat them. So I, I, my game was shot. But it wasn't until I got comfortable being who I was. I was the little guy. I was 4'11 with a size 11 shoe. I was the awkward guy. I was the strange looking dude. I had a big nose and a, and a skinny face. Yeah, I was the one. No, I wasn't cute. You could see my bones and my knees when I had on shorts. Yeah, yeah. Long legs and skinny. When, as I grew, I got long legs and skinny. The body went up, but the weight didn't come. Yeah, that's my son back there, Dallas. That's him. Okay. But I had to get comfortable being who I was and understanding that this is my game. I have to play my game. I can't play your game because your game is not suited for me. I would be the point guard, you would be the, the smaller power forward. My job was to get you the ball down low. Your job was to kick it out to me for a three. Okay, but I got to play my game. I was trying to play your game. What do I do? Five, eleven, four, eleven, five foot tall, trying to take a six foot dude down low and post him up. That ain't going to work. I had to develop the game that I was supposed to play. I could have stopped at any time. But I refused to stop because I refused to give in to what everybody was saying about me, to what the world thought about me. I, I, I've joked about it for a hundred times. Nobody around me ever knew my name except my friends. Everybody called me a little sharp, a little sharp, a little sharp, a little sharp. Surprised me a few weeks ago, we went to Harbor Inn. 
And the guy sitting over here, I knew him from the neighborhood, couldn't remember his name. He called me by my first and last name. David Sharp, how you doing? Mess me up. This is a guy that's older than my brother. My brother is 55, 56. He's older than my brother. Lived in the neighborhood. I've known him all my life as Gray. Never knew his first name. That was his last name. Gray was his last name. I found out his first name was Darren, I believe. I may be wrong on that. Daryl Gray. I don't know. Sorry if he's listening. <laughs> but he knew my name. And it made the difference in my day. As simple as that is, it made the difference in my day. But what am I saying? Don't give up on life. Ain't nothing better out there. No, it's, I'm, I'm serious. What, whatever life you have, make the best of it. Give it to God. Don't give up on life. I promise you, you won't find nothing better out there. Because if you can find something better, my God's a lie. And the God I serve has not lied. I'm not even going to say yet because he's not. He will not. He has proven over and over and over again. If you just stick with me, I got more moves to blow your mind than you can think of. You didn't know there were that many moves on the chessboard. But that game can go on. It's a chess game. It's a game of life. When you feel like you're just tired and can't take no more, let go and let God have his way. Give in to the Lord and let the Lord lead you. It's that simple. I'm done. The king still has another move. And after that move, he's got another move. And after that move, he's got another move. And his moves continue on and on and on. So don't give up. Don't throw in the towel. Just because it looks bad, don't mean it's bad. That seed that was planted in the ground had to die first, had to be covered in, with dirt and had to die, had to, be, had to open itself up for the Lord to pull it up out of the ground as a tree, a tree that produces fruit, fruit that, will, that, that produces food for for not just animals, but for people. Fruit that reproduces itself over and over and over again. So much so that you don't know the seeds that are hanging off, that have fallen off of you, that have gone somewhere else to plant the exact same tree in another vineyard to grow up again, to go over and over and over. What am I saying? Your life is like a tree. It sprouts up, produces fruit. Scripture says that they will know you by the fruit you bear. That same tree that's planted here should be planted somewhere else. And it will look identical to you. And it will speak like you. It will sound like you because it's been planted there by you through the Spirit of God. Your children, your spouse, uh, something I say to my kids all the time. My mama always say to me when I leave her presence, I love you, be careful. It's the last two things she says she will say to me when I leave her presence. My boys, when they leave my presence, I say to them, I love you, be careful, and have fun. Those three things. Dalvin went off to school, and, and his friends, when they part ways, he always tell them, be careful and have fun. One of the guys asked him, why do you always say have fun? He said, because that's what my daddy always tells me. He said, my daddy believes in having fun. He says that we should have fun in almost everything we do. He said, but we have to be careful also. So what am I saying? What my mama started, I'm just repeating. What I've repeated, my son is repeating. And the trees that I don't see are his friends that's off in school that's starting to repeat those same things. And it's going to continue on and continue on and continue on. They may add some to it, but you have to understand. This is what, what life is. We gotta make the best of it. If you're an apple tree, make applesauce. If you're an orange tree, get you some orange juice. Stay hydrated, stay, 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 stay healthy. Because the king still has another move. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> now there may be one or some that want prayer, that may be in a dark place in their life, maybe in a place where you're not really sure what's going on and you don't understand. 
Now's your time to, to come down to the altar. We have ministers. We will pray with you. I will pray for you. But if this is you and you feel you, you just want to get a, a better understanding of where God is, we can pray for you. If there's someone here that either here in this building or watching on social media, uh, the different platforms, um, if you're seeking salvation, for forgiveness is the first step to salvation, acknowledging Christ and asking for forgiveness, then that opportunity is here. If you are here and that is you, please make your way down. If you're on, uh, watching by way of social media, put it in the comments and leave us some kind of way to contact you and we'll reach out to you. Just make sure to see that you're getting, that you can get the true unadulterated word that you need for your life. Amen. Let us pray. Father, we thank you, Lord, for this time around the table. We thank you, Father, for what you have said and what you have demonstrated. We pray, God, that this word has touched the very hearts and minds of man. That, they, that this word will penetrate the heart and mind, take root, and sprout up in due season and in due time. That something was said that would change someone's life for the better, Father. That we don't leave this place in the same condition that we came. But we leave refreshed, revived, and renewed. We leave strengthened if we, were, if we were worn down. And we give you all glory, honor, and praise. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 We thank God for such encouraging word. Give the brother, Minister Sharp, a hand. We bless God for him and the word of God on this morning. It was just this morning we, while we were in the pastor study, never even knew what his message was all about. And my grandson came in, and I have a little chest set there. Goes to show you it's just not there for decorations. I know how to play the game. And he messed up all of the men. And Deacon Diggs said to him, I told him, I said, put those back the way you found them. And Deacon Diggs said to him, he said, let me show you what each piece is. And he started naming the pieces. And when he started naming the pieces, I looked up. Because there's nothing better than to have a good challenge when it comes to chess. And I said, well, if he know the pieces, he obviously know how to play the game. But I learned early on when playing chess, you don't always go in and win the first game. You lose the first game so that you can study how the opponent plays. And a good chess player knows certain moves on the board. You know which way they're going to go. Well, what I'm saying to you is sometimes God lets you lose so that you can learn the game. You can learn some things about life. But when you see certain moves, then you know that you can beat them because you know where they're going next. Well, God always knows what we're going to do because he says he knows the thoughts, the very thoughts that's in a man's heart. But a master player can put you in check on the very first play, which means God already have your life in check on the very first play. It doesn't matter what the devil does to you. He has one more move, and guess what? He has the final move. So if you stay with God, God will make sure that he bring you to the appointed place where he says, checkmate. At this time, it's our offering time. And we're getting ready to take up our tithe and our offering. If you're watching by live stream, you can actually donate your tithes and offering to the house of God at www.
thetpwc.org, or you can cash app it at T-H-E, T-P-W-C, and the number one. Make sure you put the dollar sign at the beginning, and then T-H-E, T-P-W-C, and the number one. And for those of you who are in the house of the Lord, if you will prepare yourself to come and give, as the ushers are standing up, and they're ready to receive your offering. Amen. Amen. If you're needing to come and to sow, go ahead and follow the leading of the ushers. If you're giving electronically in the house, then you're free to stay in your space and go to those options of giving. We are so grateful to the Lord and how he continues to bless the house, how he continues to bless us and to sow. Thank you so much for your faithfulness. God is just proving to us that even in a pandemic, he still has another move. Our homes are still being blessed. God is still uh, giving us the provisions and the resources that we need. And we are so grateful to him. Amen. God bless you. So much father we thank you and praise you again for the opportunity to sow into the work of the kingdom father we thank you for the provisions that we have and the resources that we have we know that all things have come of you and we bring back to you that which you have freely given to us in jesus name amen amen listen i want to share a couple of uh, things with you that are going on here at the tabernacle and i want you to make sure that you are in the loop of what is going on i want to remind you not to forget that we are enrolling for our summer program and if you know of someone that uh, is a parent of a school age child in need of summer care Please share the information. We still have flyers out in the foyer. We're asking that you take those and share. They can call and get information. Remind them that this is a safe and a nurturing environment for their young people. We are uh, subsidy approved. We weren't uh, in that area on last year, but God has blessed and we have some things in place. So make sure that you are sharing that information so that someone can be blessed by what is going on here. Also, want to share with you um, a series that we're getting ready to launch into. It's not a Bible study series. It's an opportunity uh, for us to learn and grow together, and it's entitled Getting Your House in Order. And what we're doing here at the TAB is that we're launching a church and community initiative to help you and your families do just that, get your house in order. Listen, uh, it was so uh, a little bit funny, but also a little bit sobering. On uh, Friday, we were able to serve another family here in uh, a funeral setting. And when uh, the funeral director's assistant came in, he saw me and he says, um, I think I've been here before. Don't I know you? And I was like, yeah, you do. You were here last month. And it just makes us remember that, you know, we never know where death is. And part of getting your house in order is for us to take care of the business needs in our families before 
things happen. So we want to share this information. Uh, it's in a, it's going to be in a format where we're going to be bringing in speakers, uh, people who are experienced in various fields, talking about topics such, such as home ownership, taxes, uh, credit, just to name a few. So our first installment is going to take place on Saturday, June the 11th at 10 a.m. So I want you to go ahead and put that on your calendar for Saturday, June the 11th at 10. We will be joined by Charlotte Center for Legal Advocacy. I always have trouble with that word. Charlotte Center for Legal Advocacy. At this event, we will touch on the healthcare marketplace, wills and estates, Medicare and Medicaid. So these are some topics that may be of interest to you. Listen, this is not a tab event. This is a community event. So make sure each one reach one. Bring somebody with you um, that may be able to benefit from these uh, legal services and this advocacy group that is going to be here with us. Also in the month of June, I want to uh, remind our dads to please save the date. Save the date on, it is June the, I'm sorry, it's not on my calendar. I think it's June the 18th, Saturday, June the 18th. We're going to be featuring a weekend called Nacho Average Dad. Nacho Average Dad. Our dads are going to be treated on that Saturday to a Nacho Fellowship. And then you guys are going to go off and do some male bonding over what the guys have called a bowling beatdown. So <laughs> I had nothing to do with that, but that's the competitive nature of our guys. And we want our dads to be able to hang out and have fun together. Listen, um, I've got a head count in mind, but the dads who are here, please make sure that you kind of let me know that you are going to spend the day together with us um, here at the tab. We're going to start here at the tab at 11 with the fellowship, and then we're going to let you guys break and uh, share the remainder of the afternoon in a bowling beatdown. And we'll have some more specific details on that, but for now, I want to make sure. And listen, dads, if you don't bowl, you still can be a part of the group. Listen, it's fun to go and laugh and fellowship because there's some funny stuff that happens at the bowling alley, okay? Amen. While we're on the dad's beat down bowl, want to say to all of you uh, dads that if you come and you don't bowl, we're still going to be giving away gas cards like we did for Mother's Day. We're still going to be giving away our gas cards, but you have to be present in order to receive the gas card. So that's part of the fellowship. Also in the way of our summer camp program, if you have children that need financial assistance, we have received a grant for, for you and we may be able to give a scholarship to some for the whole summer as well as may be able to pay part of your tuition. So if you know of children that needs to be placed in the summer, please, Make sure that you let us know before all of the spot actually get filled up. All right. Bishop, um, we have fellowshipping with us today. Ronald and Deidre Massey shared with us in the service today, and they heard about the tab through Sister Tasha Sharp. And so we just pray that you enjoy your service today. And I'm reading the face with the mask, but is this my sister, Yvette? right there. I thought it was. I, I'm looking at the eyes. Um, it's so good to see you uh, in the house with us. That's Sister Avis's bestest friend. And uh, so that makes her our bestest friend. And we're just glad that the Lord has blessed and kept her. To all of you, um, it's so good to see you. Uh, it's such a blessing to see Mother Mary in the house. That's why we went up and got excited <laughs> because we know even as Minister Sharp preached, that the Lord had another move. Whatever happened, it happened, but the Lord had another move, and we are so grateful. To all of my young people who wanted to sit with me today, that's why they're on the front. Somebody might say, it ain't youth day, but they say, Pastor, can, I, can we sit beside you? I say, you can. So they are at the front sitting with me. These are my new bestest friends, all right? <laughs> we're going to close, and we're going to go home. Okay, what's that? Re 
are you the, so they they didn't replace you we're just sharing we're sharing that's that new generation okay my older baby's getting jealous good to see the Kimballs back in the house can we give them some love amen come on and stand we're going home listen whatever you're going to do on this memorial uh, holiday make sure that you don't forget what it means the memorial holiday is to remember those men and women who died on the battlefield for our freedoms this is not veterans these are people who died giving their lives so that we can vote and we can live and exercise our rights. Come on, as messed up as we are still in the United States, I don't want to live in any other country. Amen. And we give God the glory for those who gave the ultimate sacrifice. Again, thank you so much to those of you who helped us serve on Friday. Listen, you guys were amazing. And the Cornelius family was very appreciative uh, at the blessing that we were able. And this will not be the only way in which we are serving. But this just shows us that what God has called us to do is to be an extension in the community for those when they have a need. This man didn't go to church here, neither did his family. But the church has to be the church where to all men. Father, we just thank you and we praise you for allowing us to gather together again. Thank you, God, for keeping us and not allowing, God, any sickness or disease to separate us. Father, we thank you because we are COVID cure and we stand in divine healing in the name of Jesus. Now, Father, help us to take the word and the worship and to draw near to you in our heart and to live out in our lives that men and women might in this hour have hope that yes, God, you are still on the throne and you have not just one more move, you have more moves than we could ever imagine that you could do in our lives. Now bless your people, God, as they go back out into the world. Keep them covered in Jesus' name, amen. As always, I'm gonna ask our seniors if you'll exit out of the front of the church. All others, if you'll take that side entrance, blessings, and we'll see you in the house on Tuesday. Seat at the table. Can I have everybody that's on the seat at the table real quickly? Um, on the